morning. Welcome to God's house. Happy to have you all here this morning. We've reached the 19th Sunday in the season of Pentecost. The Bible is clear that only the righteous will enter the kingdom of heaven. And so the question we ask this morning is, are you on the way of righteousness? What does that mean? What is the way of righteousness? And how do we know if we're on it? That will be the focus of our worship this morning. Please join in singing our first hymn. It's hymn 306. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children, but we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, He has removed your guilt forever. You are His own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to His will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
Let us pray. Mercifully grant, O God, that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. For without your help we are unable to please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The first lesson for this 19th Sunday in the season of Pentecost comes to us from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 18. The point that Ezekiel makes in these words is that the way of righteousness is an intent in a very personal, intensely personal travel. It's an intensely personal travel path. You can't repent for me, I can't repent for you. You can't believe for me, I can't believe for you. And the the Israelites were confused about this. The Lord was punishing them for their disobedience, for their impenitence at this time. And they blamed it on their parents. They said, why is the Lord punishing us for the sins of our parents? And the Lord says, you've got it all wrong. I will judge each of you according to your sin. Each of you according to your repentance. Each of you according to your faith. It is the Lord's will for each of us to repent and live. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean, you who keep repeating this proverb concerning the soil of Israel? Fathers eat sour grapes and their sons' teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the Lord God, you will never again use this proverb in Israel. Indeed, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father is mine just like the soul of the Son. The soul who sins is the one who will die. But you say the Lord's way is not fair. Listen now, house of Israel. Is it my way that is not fair? Is it not your ways that are not fair? If a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and practices unrighteousness, he will die because of it. Because of the unrighteousness that he has practiced, he will die. But if a wicked man turns from his wickedness that he has done and practices justice and righteousness, He will preserve his life. Because he has seen and turned away from all the rebellious acts that he had committed, he will surely live and he will not die. But the house of Israel says the Lord's way is not fair. Is it really my ways that are not fair, O house of Israel? Is it not your ways that are not fair? Therefore I will judge each one of you according to his ways. O house of Israel, declares the Lord God, repent and turn away from all your rebellious acts, so that you will not set out a stumbling block that makes you guilty. Throw off from yourselves all your rebellious actions by which you have rebelled, and obtain a new heart and a new spirit for yourselves. Why should you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. So repent and live. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our psalm of the day at Psalm 25 on page 74.
The second lesson comes to us from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13, beginning at verse 5. He says several times in these words, examine yourselves. Again, the intensely personal nature of repentance and faith. How do you examine yourself, though? What are you to examine? Well, as we ought to do, we should do every, before every time we receive the Lord's Supper, we are to, are to examine our lives according to the Ten Commandments, to see if we have lived according to them, to see if we have been obedient to our Father's will. Of course, we will all recognize that we haven't. And so that examination is not intended to create saving faith or to save us, but rather to lead us to repentance, to lead us to admit that we have fallen short and to put our trust in Jesus for salvation. Examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not know this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless perhaps you fail the test? But I hope that you will recognize that we are not failing the test. We pray to God that you may not do anything evil, not so that we may appear to have passed the test, but so that you may do what is good, even if we may seem like those who are failing to pass the test. To be sure, we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Please join in singing our next hymn. It's hymn 461.
Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. We read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, beginning at verse 28. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered, I will not, but later he changed his mind and went. He came to the second and said the same thing. The second son answered, I will go, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Amen, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you did not believe him. However, the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. Even when you saw this, you did not change your mind and believe him. This is the gospel of our Lord, we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Your fellow redeemed friends in Christ Jesus, who shows us the true way of righteousness. Second thoughts. We've all had them, and we all know that there are good second thoughts and there are bad second thoughts. If you are having second thoughts about the spouse or the house or the career path that you've chosen, that's probably not a good thing. However, there are good second thoughts, right? On second thought, maybe I won't have that second helping of dessert. On second thought, maybe instead of spending my evening endlessly scrolling through Amazon getting ready for Prime Day, I will instead read my Bible or read a devotion. Maybe for children, especially hard these days, maybe instead, on second thought, instead of playing video games, I will actually do my homework today. There are good second thoughts and bad second thoughts. The parable Jesus teaches us today tells us about two sons who had second thoughts. And he uses it as a way of warning and rebuking anyone who would refuse to have a second thought about him. Now the first and most obvious question that comes to mind in reading this parable is who do the two sons represent? Many of the early church fathers believed that they represented the nation of Israel on one hand, and then the Gentile nations around them on the other. And that would appear to agree with the parable, right? The, the nation of Israel seemed to be those who said, yes, yes, Lord, I will do, we will do your will. They were the Old Testament church. They were God's chosen people. They had the priesthood, they had the sacrifices, they had the ceremonies, they had the tabernacle. But as Ezekiel told us, even though they said yes, even though they appeared to be obedient, they were really disobedient. They often went off on their own way. And the Gentile nations around, they, they seemed to say no. They went chasing after idols, after false gods. But later on in history, when the gospel was proclaimed to every nation, Gentiles from those very same nations repented and believed. They changed their minds afterwards. There are other interpreters who believe that these sons represent the more immediate context. And Jesus is speaking this parable to the, the leaders of the Jews, to the chief priests and the elders. And so in that context, then, then the chief priests and the elders would be the yes men who appear to be obedient, who appear to be on the way of righteousness, but, but secretly are saying no in their hearts because they don't believe that Jesus is the Savior sent from God. And the, the boy, the son who said no and then later changed his mind would be the, the prostitutes and the tax collectors who, who appeared by their lifestyle to be walking in the opposite way that God wanted them to go. But when they heard the gospel, they repented, they believed, they changed their minds. I think we, either one of those interpretations is probably valid, but to go too far, to spend too much time talking about either one of them doesn't really do us any good, does it? That would leave us out of the picture. It's easy enough to hurl stones at, at the, the children of Israel who were renowned for rebelling against their Lord. For we, It'd be easy for us to say those Jewish leaders at the time of Jesus, how evil they were. In fact, Jesus told this parable on Tuesday of Holy Week. Right after this, 
they set out to kill Jesus. It'd be easy to talk about them, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, all the evil people, but that wouldn't do us any good. Unless we see ourselves in these two sons, we're just wasting our time. I think it's pretty easy to see ourselves in these sons, isn't it? In a sense, every single Christian in the world is the first son, the one who said no and then changed his mind. We were born into this world hostile to God. We were born saying no right to God's face. And if you doubt that, just consider how many times you say no to his face still today. Every Christian is that first son. We said no to God until he sent his Holy Spirit to bring us to repentance, to force us to have a second thought about the way we were going and to repent and turn to the way of God. It's the second son that gets a little more interesting, right? The one who said yes, but then didn't do his father's will, didn't go and work in the vineyard. Yes, men are very prevalent still today in the church. I think of every confirmand who's ever stood here and said, I will give up everything, I will give up my life rather than turn away from the truth, rather than deny Christ and his word. And yet we all know many, many young people who say yes and they swear allegiance to God here and they they walk out those doors and they are never heard from again. I mean, there's a more basic sense. There are often opportunities to serve in the church. We we say we need help with, with counting offerings or with cleaning or cutting the grass or leading or any variety of things. And And people often say, yes, yes, sign me up, sign me up. And then when it comes time to actually do the work, there's no one there to do it. I'll go and visit people. I'll call people today. I'll say, I haven't seen you in church lately. Can I count on seeing you on Sunday? And they'll say, oh, I'll be there, Pastor. And I'll just see an empty spot where they would be. I'll say to families, do you know how important it is that your children are in Sunday school week after week to build a foundation of faith that will carry them throughout their lives? Of course, we'll have them there every week. Our attendance numbers tell something else, though. Why is it that we're so quick to say yes when it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to God's will, and then we're so reluctant, we so often fail to follow through? Well, I think we say yes, especially of the confirmands. We say yes because no is a a dirty word in the church. You don't ever say no. Who dares say no to the pastor or to the, the church council? Who dares say no to God? But when you say yes with no intention of following through, that that proves that we have a false understanding of what it means to do the will of God. God isn't just interested in us giving him lip service. He isn't just interested in our good intentions. He's interested in us following through. And if this parable teaches us one thing, it's that words and actions speak louder than words alone. If we say yes, but in our hearts and in our lives, we are really saying no. This parable is meant to bring us to repentance, to show us that we haven't done everything we said we would do. So the real question becomes, how do you combine the best of both sons? How do you become the son who says yes, and then you go and follow through? I'll give you a little hint. The only way we can do that is through the third son, but we'll we'll come back to him later. Jesus told this parable to the Pharisees. He said, what do you think? He, He was asking for their opinion. What do you think? Which of these sons did the will of the father? What's, what's the right answer to that question? They settle on the first, right? They, they are focused on works. They're focused on obedience. So they figure, well, the one who said no, but then later went and worked, he's the one who did the will of the father. You see that Jesus is setting up a trap here? Either way they go, neither son was perfectly obedient, were they? Jesus has them trapped. No matter which answer they give, They're pointing to a disobedient son. And that leads us to our second question this morning. What is the will of the Father? What what does the Father really want us to do? And in the parable, it's pretty obvious. The, The Father wanted the sons, both of them, to say, yes, I'll go, 
and then to go and do it, to go and work in the vineyard. But how does that relate to us? How does it relate to us working in the vineyard? Well, what is the, the will of the Father? And I, I think we have a tendency, we're, we're almost hardwired from birth to say, think of the will of God in a very narrow and, frankly, selfish, self-centered sense. I think we, we, we view the will of God as, as the Ten Commandments and then the other, the other decisions that we make in our lives about you know, how, what does God want me to do for a living, where does he want me to live, who does he want me to marry, when does he, if, does he want me to retire or not. In other words, we think of God's will very much in relation to the law. That's failing to see that God's will is much bigger than us. God's will is much bigger than what we do on a day-to-day basis. God's will encompasses all people of all time. In fact, when you piece together God's will from Scripture, you see that it is not God's will that any sinner would be lost, that any sinner would be perished, but rather that all come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. And and in order to accomplish that great, all-encompassing will, God had to put His will into action. As Paul told the Galatians in chapter 4, When the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. That's God's will. You think that's something you can do? Of course not. That's God's will, but it has nothing to do with our behavior or our obedience. It has everything to do with the obedience of the third son. Because you know as well as I do that we chafe under God's will. We don't really like being told what to do or what to believe. We want to go our own way. And that way would only lead to death. That way would only lead to rebellion. That puts us not on the way of righteousness, but on the way of unrighteousness, the way that leads to death and hell. So remember this, when you, when you chafe against the will of God, when you want to go your own way because you don't think God's way is right, remember this, God has never asked you to do what he asked his son to do. He asked his son to leave his throne in heaven, to be born of a virgin, to suffer the mockery and the torture of men here on earth, and to die for your sins. It's hard for us to comprehend, but C.S. Lewis puts it pretty vividly in uh, his book, Mere Christianity. He says this about about what Jesus did. The eternal being who knows everything and who created the whole universe became not only a man, but before that a baby, and before that a fetus inside a woman's body. If you want to get the hang of it, think how you would like to become a slug or a crab. Would you willingly trade places with a pet hamster? And yet, and yet that's what Jesus did. In fact, he went even farther than that According to Psalm 22, as Jesus was hanging on that cross, bleeding for our sins, he said, I am a worm and not a man. That is the will of God. Jesus is the third son. He's the one we desperately need because we so often have exhibited the very worst traits of both of the first two sons. How often haven't we said, oh yes, Lord, I will do your will. I will serve you, only not to do it, to do the very opposite. How often have we said, no, Lord, I don't think I want to do your will today. And even if we change our minds, that's still rebellion, isn't it? Which of you parents would accept from your child, no, even if they later change their minds? So thank God for Jesus. Thank God for that third son. Thank God that that he said, yes, Father, I will go to earth and live a perfect life in their place, and then he did it. Thank God that Jesus said, yes, Father, I will die the death they deserve, and he suffered it once and for all. Thank God that it was the Father's will to crush him instead of you, to cause him to suffer rather than you. Remember that when you think of God's will for your life. Jesus suffered. Jesus was crushed so you wouldn't have to be. Jesus left his Father's vineyard to die so that you might have a place in it. So how does that relate to what God's will for us right now is? What is the work that we are to do in the kingdom now that we're in for Jesus' sake? Again, 
we often automatically think it's something I got to do, right? Here's, here's where we're going to talk about giving more in offerings or volunteering more of our time or giving more of our effort or spending more time in prayer. And yet Jesus clears up exactly what the work of God is in John chapter 6. He says the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. To believe that Jesus has done the work you haven't do, done. To believe that Jesus said yes every time you said no. To believe that Jesus followed tr- through on his promise every time you failed. This is the will of the Father. To save you through Jesus. That you would believe that through him you are saved. And that's the Father's will for you. I think that becomes clear even in our parable, right? Right? Why did Jesus condemn the the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and the chief priests? It wasn't because they didn't obey. It was because they didn't believe. Believe that the will of God for you is to save you. And that leads us to our final question. Not only what is the will of the Father, but what is the way of righteousness that John came to bring? Well, we, what do we know about John? We know that John came preaching in the wilderness on the Jordan River. He, he preached against the sins of the prostitutes and the tax collectors and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, all of them. He preached repentance and he said, change your lives. Is that the way of righteousness? Well, not if Paul has anything to say about it. Remember what Paul said about linking righteousness before God and obedience to the law. He said, if there had been a law given that could give life, certainly righteousness would have been derived from the law. If you think that the way of righteousness depends on your obedience, your behavior, you're just going to be exposed as a failure. You're either going to be exposed as that first son who says no, in that you never really wanted to do God's will in the first place, or you'll be revealed as that hypocritical second son who said yes, but then you don't do it in your life anyway. The way of righteousness cannot be the way of the law, the way of obedience. And that comes out very clearly in an event from very early in Jesus' ministry. All the way back in Matthew 3, when Jesus came out to John at the Jordan, you remember what happened? Jesus said, John, I need to be baptized by you. And John, John goes, whoa, I, I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And Jesus responded, it is right for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. That is the righteousness that John came to bring. He's talking about baptism there. And I, I want you to picture it this way, that, that when Jesus stepped down into that water of the Jordan, all of the sins of people were were attached to him. He absorbed all of our sins so that when when we are baptized, our sins go into that water and are put on him and his righteousness covers us instead. The way of righteousness that, that John came to preach about wasn't about doing, but believing. It was the righteousness of that third son, that perfect son. And so here's the second thought that that Jesus wants us to have this morning about God's will, about his will as it is enumerated in the Ten Commandments. Recognize that he didn't give you the Ten Commandments so that you could save yourself. He didn't say, this is the way I want you to walk so that you can earn heaven for yourself. That's impossible. In the the context of our parable, which son should we be? Neither. Right? Right? Neither. God doesn't want you to say no to his will, even if you later change your mind. Nor does he want you to stand here and say, yes, Father, yes, I'll do it, only to go out there and and do anything but. So what is the right response? What is God looking for from us? He wants us to say, no, Lord, I can't. I haven't and I can't do your will, but Jesus has in my place. That's the way of righteousness. The way of righteousness is one of personal, heartfelt repentance, personal, heartfelt faith that Jesus is that perfect third son and that in him, so are we. 
There are good thoughts, second thoughts, and there are bad second thoughts. Jesus shows us some good second thoughts in this parable. He shows us that we are these sons. Thank God that he's the perfect third son who saved us. He shows us that the will of the Father is not so much what we are to do day to day, how we are to behave, but that we are to believe that Jesus is the Savior that he has sent gives us a second thought about the way of righteousness. That the only way of righteousness there is is the one that comes through faith in Christ Jesus. And when you have those second thoughts, then you too will gladly say yes to your Father and joyfully work in His vineyard today and forever. Amen. Please stand as we confess the Apostles' Creed on page 5 in your worship folder. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord God, we thank you for the wondrous gift of Jesus Christ, your Son, and for the promised graces we have received through him. We thank you that through his perfect life and his obedient death on the cross, we have been granted cleansing and pardon for all our sins. Help us believe and trust in him, love and serve him, that in all our thoughts, words, and actions, we may manifest his spirit. Dwell in our homes, O Lord, and let the trust of our families be centered in you alone, so that no difficulty, trial, or adversity rob us of the conviction that you are our helper in every time of need. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.